All right, let's do it. Philippians 3, verses 1 through 11. Uh, that's where we're going to be. That's really where we're going to camp out. I want to uh, make a quick pit stop just to start in Matthew. Feel free to stay in Philippians 3 uh, and just hear uh, the words from Matthew that I'll read to us. But um, as I was preparing this, I, I kept being brought back to um, a warning that Jesus gave in the Sermon on the Mount, right? So today we're going to read a warning that Paul gives to the church at Philippi, all right? But Jesus gives a warning that is right along these lines to the people he's preaching to in the, the Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew 7, all right? So he's, Jesus is talking about this idea of, of full surrender, He's talking about this authenticity of, of, of the Christian life, of, of being a disciple for him, okay? And I, I want us just to, to hear this word, and, and I want to tell you before we even get into it that it's heavy. This is a heavy word from, from our Savior. And I'm not trying to, to kind of do a drive-by guilting here today. That's not my intention, right? Because the good news is that Jesus has has saved uh, those of us who believe and, and the work is done. We're going to be in glory with him forever, right? This isn't some fear-mongering time. If you've ever experienced fear-mongering in the church, it's, it's not the Lord who's, who's trying to scare you, right? But here's the thing. God invites us into something more beautiful. But Jesus says this in chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And if I'm honest, this keeps me up at night as a pastor. Because there's some of us who think that we're, we're doing what the Lord wants us to. We're living this Christian life when really we're just doing Christian-y things. And we're being fooled. And I think it's good and right for us to, to evaluate whether or not that's us. Jesus wouldn't give us this warning if we weren't supposed to evaluate if we know him or if we don't. If we know him, if we're just doing Christian-y things or if we actually know him. This is heavy, but this is a warning for us, church, because, because here's the thing. Here's my question. Church, do you know him? Do you know this Jesus? Do you know him? Not just show up to church, not just do Christian-y things. Do you know him? Maybe a better question would be, do you value him? Is he worth something to you? Because you know what, in Matthew 13, if you flip a few pages, we, we see the value that's placed on Jesus and his kingdom. Jesus says in 1344, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Jesus is worth everything. He's not just worth a couple compartments in your drawer. He's not just worth Christian-y things. He's worth it all. His value is infinite. There's supreme value in, in knowing this Jesus. Nothing equates. You can take everything else that besides Jesus in your life and reject it because he is all. And that is where we find salvation. In knowing Jesus alone. All of the things that we try to tack on in order to earn our salvation or earn some merit or, or become this good person, they are exactly that. They're tacked onto the truth. They're not part of the truth. And church, I don't want to make people wonder if, if they are saved in here. That's not my intention, right? If, if, if you have, have surrendered to the Lord and, and he has saved you, you are good. You are hidden with Christ, Colossians 3, until the end. You are, you are fine, you're safe and secure. It's over. But church, the question I'm asking is, do you know him? 
Even for those of you who don't believe in here, do you know him? Are you hungry for more of him? We must ask this question because Jesus isn't just asking for us to go through motions. He wants us to know him, and man, oh man, is he worth knowing. Paul gets after this in Philippians 3 today. We're going to go there. Sorry I didn't open up with fluffy illustration, but we ain't got no time for it, all right? (laughs) Philippians 3, 1 through 11, if you will and you're able, would you stand to honor the reading of God's word? I'm reading from the English Standard Version this morning. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision. We worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Verse 7, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Lord, this is your word, and we are grateful for it. Open up our hearts to what you have for us this morning, God. We want to hear from you and you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So we have some hashing out to do here, but, but right off the bat, Paul talks joy. He says, rejoice. I'm not afraid to, to keep repeating myself, right? He's, he's a regular old preacher here. He says, rejoice. He's even a regular old preacher because he's, he's kind of alluding to the fact that he's about to land the plane and he goes for another two chapters, right? Okay, so he says, rejoice, my friends. This is the theme of Philippians, the epistle of joy. Rejoice. Because the Lord is both the source and the occasion of our joy. He's the particular event and he is the reason where our joy is derived. Paul is kind of setting some groundwork for where he's about to go, all right? Because if we read this text, in verse 2, he begins to get a little nasty, right? He begins to get a little vicious. Verse 1, he's saying rejoice and then he's calling people dogs in the second verse, all right, we're just calling it like we see it, right? Paul is, Paul is out here to make a point known. He says, rejoice, but he is, he is setting the groundwork on purpose, right? He is reminding the church at Philippi, hey, I have told you that, that Jesus is your joy, that you can have joy in all circumstances. In fact, the joy of the Lord is, going, is what's going to lead you to resilience even when you face challenges, even when you face the false teaching that he is about to warn them against, He says rejoice, pointing them towards this idea that joy can be had in all situations. But as he's speaking rejoice, he's kind of threading this whip together that he's about to crack. All right, Matthew Henry said this about joy. The joy of the Lord will arm us against the assaults of our spiritual enemies and put our mouths out of taste for those pleasures with which the tempter baits his hooks. Hey, church, if you're taking one thing away from this preaching series, it is that the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is what kept Paul going, and the joy of the Lord is what will keep us going as well. And it's possible in all circumstances. Because another theme in Philippians is suffering. But the theme above that is joy. Joy in suffering, joy in all things. Let's catch on to that. But then in verse 2, he kind of changes his tone a little bit, all right? And and verses 2 through 11, we're going to split it up here, all right? Paul gives a warning. Paul shares his own example. And then Paul talks about his Savior, 
All right? But let's see, let's see this warning here in verse 2. And I'll read 3 as well. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evil doers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. All right? He's not talking about puppies, all right, running around the street or something like that. Okay? He's not talking about, as my daughter would say, a wolf wolf that you see in the park. Right? He's, what he's doing is, is he's talking about the Judaizers. And he throws out three pretty powerful names, nasty names, dogs, evildoers, mutilators of the flesh, because he's trying to push forward a point, warning the church at Philippi against these Judaizers. These are Jewish Christians who insisted that Gentiles must submit to the Mosaic law, that they must be circumcised. Rather than, than knowing that Jesus bought a new way, he's, they're saying, no, you, you, in order to be saved by Jesus, Jesus is kind of over here. He's an addition, but you need to also do these list of things. Judaizers mark their faith by rules and regulations and not the helpful type, right? I just want to say sometimes rules or disciplines kind of get a bad rap in the church, right? But when rules and disciplines point you further on to Christ, they are okay, but when rules and disciplines are the end-all, be-all, which they are for the Judaizers, that is where legalism comes into play, and that is an issue. In fact, when we get into chapter 4, it talks about how, how do we keep our mind on Christ? What are some disciplines? What are some things that we could think on and remind ourselves of? That's where discipline comes into place in order to, be, uh, to live for Christ well. But here's the thing. Discipline was all that they had. They weren't really going after Jesus. They were deterring themselves and others from Jesus by following this set of rules. And Paul comes out swinging, using this strong language, saying, calling them dogs. And he's kind of flipping the tables here because the Judaizers called Christians dogs because they were unclean to them. They didn't follow the, the ceremonial law of Israel. So Paul turns it around and kind of alludes that they, they are the ones who are filthy. They are the ones who are unclean. And he continues on saying that they are evildoers. Where all their attention is going towards these rules and regulations and what was meant for good was actually evil for them. Giving no attention to Christ. They were keeping a scorecard. And the scorecard didn't just have Christ on it. It had all of these other things, all these other checkboxes. And then he pulls out kind of the, the heaviest one at the end, mutilators of flesh. Those who give themselves to circumcision in order to merit favor, in order to be saved. The Judaizers took pride in this. They were the ones who were circumcised. They were the clean ones. And, and that was what made them better than the rest. That is what actually made them true Christians. But that just isn't the case here. They believed it served a greater purpose, but it didn't, as long as they were believing in Christ. So really what's happening here is you have this Old Testament right idea where, where you must adhere to these rules and these laws. And the Judaizers are buying into that completely. And, and Paul is saying, hey, listen, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but that's not an end-all, be-all. Christ is the end-all, be-all. He has paid the price already. He has already done all this stuff for you. You're not going to be able to do that with perfection. Jesus has lived with perfection. He has done it all. Paul's fiery warning shows that he cares. He's saying, look out, Philippi. Watch out. He's protecting the flock from falsehood. He's saying, watch out for this mentality. It may be kind of sleek. It may weasel your way in there. It may be like one of these conversations in the church lobby where it's like, hey, you, need, you really need to be doing this, this, and this in order to really have Jesus love you. No, that's not the case. He's, he's warning them against this. And in verse 3, he reorients them. He says in verse 3, for we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. He says the Judaizers are being circumcised, but hey, hey church, we are the circumcision. We already are the people of God. Circumcised or not, we are the people of God. We worship as a way of life by the Spirit of God within us, glorying in Jesus. And then he wraps this all up by saying this, this beautiful phrase, putting no confidence in the flesh putting no confidence in ourselves. John Calvin defines the flesh so simply, but it's beautiful. The flesh of mankind. He says, the flesh is anything that isn't Christ. Paul had confidence in Christ alone. 
He put no confidence in anything that wasn't Jesus. He didn't even trust himself. Only Jesus. Church, we're not called to be the religious wolf pack that the Judaizers portrayed themselves as. And so often we find ourselves portraying ourselves as as well. Wolf packs don't welcome, they're exclusive, they're territorial. But here's the thing. The gospel isn't. The gospel isn't. The work is done by Christ alone, not us. We don't have to add or meet some unattainable standard. It's just not true. So the Judaizers had all these check boxes, this long list of what made them good. And, and Paul's saying, relax. If you believe on Jesus, surrender to him, you are the circumcision. The work is done. The work is done. But then Paul, this is where he gets a little, like he gets a little jersey here, okay? He gets a little nasty. He continues on. He's kind of facetious, but he he goes on to say in verses 4 to 7, or 6, he goes on to share a little bit about his example. He's kind of saying, all right, you want to go? You want to go tit for tat on on who is better? Let's go. Come on. Come on. Let's go. Okay. Let's take a look at my life, all right? Verse 4, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. If, that, if some of that doesn't make sense to you, it's okay. He's saying that he has nailed it when it comes to Judaism. He was the creme de la creme, the cream of the crop, top of the line. He was nailing it before he turned to Christ and rejected everything else. I mean, he, ta- he, he lists seven things, and he's kind of lining up a point, but he's building up his resume for the, the people at Phil- by the church of Philippi to see how useless his resume really is, but also for any Judaizer who reads this, for them to see, wow, maybe I have something wrong here. He talks about things that he has inherited, but also personal things that he has nailed. He says, number one, I was circumcised seven days after birth. He, he's an eighth dayer. For Jews, that means something. When you're circumcised on the eighth day, it means you're, you, from day one, have been a Jew. It's strict compliance with the Abrahamic covenant and showing that he didn't convert later in life. He was an eighth day Jew. And then he also says, number two, he's of the people of Israel. He was a pure-blooded Israelite. He was an insider. He was one of them. Number three, from the tribe of Benjamin, This is good, this reputation so far. This is really good. Tribe of Benjamin only tried to remain faithful to Judah and the house of David after Solomon. In fact, King Solomon, the first king of Israel, or King Saul, excuse me, King Saul, the first king of Israel, was was Paul's namesake, right? Before Paul came to know Christ, he was Saul. So he's really nailing it. Number four, he's a Hebrew of Hebrews. This means he has Hebrew parents. Heritage means something. Pedigree means something in Judaism. He spoke Hebrew, Aramaic, and and not only did he speak it, but he read the scriptures in that way, and he prayed in that way. This guy's really nailing it right now. He stuttered under a stuttered. (laughs) I did that last night, too. I need to get my act together. He studied under Gamaliel one of the best rabbis at the time. He was a private school Jewish boy. Circumcised seven days after birth, people of, of the people of Israel, from the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews. And it doesn't stop there. It gets more personal. He was a Pharisee. The Pharisees were the most respected, impressive group in the first century. They were an elite denomination within Israel, and they were known for distancing themselves from the unclean. They were the best of the best. And this most likely meant that he came from ancestors that were Pharisees. I mean, Paul's really showing that that he's a heavyweight. He is a heavyweight. He could hold his own. But number six, he says, I was a persecutor of the church. I persecuted these Christians. In fact, at, at Stephen's stoning, I was there. I watched that man die, and I affirmed it. And at the end, he wraps it up, and he says, I am blameless was blameless according to the law. 
He's not talking about perfection. He's not talking about sinlessness, but he's talking about this exemplary life regarding the law. Paul just lists this this long list that only pertain to, to the guys who really made it to the top. His amazing credentials, he was the best of the best when it came to Judaism. He had status, prestige, honor, reverence, even comfort within those circles. And he says, you know what? You add that all up, all that I have gained, all that I have had, really nailing it, really achieving, overachieving, becoming more than than some people could ever imagine. And he says in verse 7, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Whatever gain I had, it's worth nothing compared to knowing Christ. All of that good rep, all of those good, good checks off of, uh, off of my list of check boxes, all of them, I rejected all. All of my achievements are, are rubbish. They're excrement. They're, they're useless waste. They mean nothing. Paul puts supreme value in, in knowing Christ alone. In Christ, he's gained it all. He has no confidence in himself, but all the confidence in Christ. So church, I want to come back to this question. Do you know this Jesus? Do you know this Jesus? Or or have you made this list of rules and regulations, this, this worldly standard that just isn't what he's asking of us? Church, where does your confidence lie? Paul's confidence didn't lie in himself. It lied in Christ alone. What is your list? Because we have a list, right? We have things that we add to Jesus. What does your list look like? What tallies are you keeping? Is it that you've never missed a Sunday at church? You read the Bible regularly. You're generally nice to people. You don't swear unless you stub your toe and no one's around. And even then, it's like a Christian swear word, so it's not really a real swear word. And the Christian subculture is like, (laughs) you have a Christian bumper sticker. You tell people online, rather than arguing online on Facebook, you tell people who you disagree with politically, you say, I'll be praying for you. Maybe you only... Listen to Star 99.1, not other radio. Maybe you have a great reputation. Maybe none of your family is in jail. You have all the money you need. You're climbing the corporate ladder. Maybe you look so clean from the outside. You've really nailed it. People think highly of you, and you do all of these things. And, man, even some things, just like Paul, some of these things really are good, right? They don't dishonor the Lord, but, but you do all these things and you raise it to this level above Christ. You're not trying to reach Christ, but you're trying to do these things in order to be better, to be good. I want to just say, none of those things will save you. None of those things will save you. I'm not saying it's wrong to to believe that they're good things because some of those things are good. Listening to Star 99 rolling down the street isn't a bad thing. It's a good thing. You're filling your mind with with, with Christ-centered thinking. Doing all of these things for, for the Lord isn't a bad thing, but when made ultimate, When put above Christ, they have no value at the gates of heaven. Paul gives a resounding, who cares about your list? Who cares about your list of things? It's all lost next to Christ, my Lord. Don't add to Christ. Don't put this list above him or below him. He's done it all. In adding to him, you're diminishing from him. He has finished the work. And on the flip side of that, when you have the whole world with no Christ, you have nothing at all. Church, why are we so easily satisfied? Why are we so easily satisfied with things that we kind of shape up and wrap up to be Christ when it's not him at all? 
Life under the gospel is an utter repudiation of our resume, not only the bad, but also the good. Christ is all. He alone has surpassing worth. In descending from our pedestals, we are identifying with the Lord. In descending from this list, we are identifying with the Lord, just as our Lord has descended himself to come for us. When we get to the gates of heaven and we stand in front of Christ, we're going to have that portfolio with us. And guess what? When we open our portfolio, the only thing that's going to matter is if Christ is in there. Knowing Christ. Not how much money you give to this kitchen fund. Not, what, not, not the, the fact that you, you're, you're getting up every morning and, and getting into the Word. Those things are good things, right? But all that's going to matter is knowing Christ. All that's going to matter is knowing Christ. And I'll tell you what, we are hesitant. I'll speak for myself. Sometimes I am hesitant because I see the lust of this world. I want to hold things tightly. I want, you know, when I'm working towards a master's, that I'm, gonna, I'm on the home stretch. I'm going to graduate. And once I have that master's, I want to tell people I have a master's. But guess what I'm not taking with me to heaven? A master's. Like, I get it. We want to hold things tightly. We want to identify with certain things other than Christ. We want to add things. We just do. But here's the thing. This is so important to note. Paul did not groan at all at what he could have been because he knew Christ is incredibly more. Like, Paul could have been the best of the best. He wasn't like, yeah, man, I could have been this, but here I am getting stoned in Lystra again. Like, he just didn't do that. Some of us want to kind of go, yeah, well, back, back in high school, man, I, you know, all this kind of stuff. I used to, you know, a different girl every weekend. I used to have a lot of fun partying. I was the center of the party. Like, what in the world is wrong with us? We don't want to let these things go. Because we want to hold tightly to the things that once fascinated us falsely. You know, Calvin, Calvin gives, John Calvin talks about this story, and, and to describe this, he talks about a ship on the sea, and the, and the sea is rough, and, and, and the ship is going back and forth, and they begin, you know what, we need to get stuff off of this boat, we need to balance things out, we need to lighten the ship, so people start throwing things over. They start throwing things over, and the ship presses on, the storm begins to settle, and then everybody gathers on the top deck, and, and they look back and they l lament at everything floating that they have lost. But here's the thing. Paul doesn't look back. Paul doesn't lament on any of it because he doesn't count it as loss. And Paul continues on in, in verses 8 to 11. As he begins to wrap up this train of thought, he says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And he continues this thought. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his, in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Sur the surpassing worth of knowing Christ alone is all that mattered to Paul. Church, it's all that matters to us. It's all that matters to us. Jesus is infinitely greater than all. If Christ alone is all, then knowing him is everything. Then knowing this, Jesus is everything. And I even feel, and I'm sorry, i got to pause again here and just talk about this in my own. I even feel some of the tension in me and when I have conversations with others, like this idea of, is this even possible? Paul's kind of faith. Is that even possible? Like this idea of having so much confidence in the Lord that you just live in a different way. If we begin to really live that way, we're going to begin to look a little weird. We're going to begin to handle situations differently. Is that even possible to know him and to really have that confidence? Because Paul is, is enamored by Christ. We even see in Psalm 63, we see David enamored by Christ. Let, let's look at that. Psalm 63, 1 through 8. Oh God, you are my God. He's longing. He's so hungry. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. Is in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. 
So I bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as, as with rich and fat food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. And when I remember you upon my bed and meditate you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Church, I, I just want to be real. I, I want to be straight up with us. This type of intimacy with our God is still possible. There's still more of him to be had for us. There's still more of him to be had for us. You can grow in intimacy with the one true God. Actually, in Ephesians, Paul tells us that we are going to unpack who he is through the ages. It's never going to stop. I'm not so convinced that when we get to heaven, all of our questions are going to be answered. I think it's going to be eternally unfolding putting our hearts in awe of who he is. And if we're real, sometimes it's going to be hard because we're going to feel the tug of former things. We're going to feel the tug of, of wanting to not count what is lost is lost, and we're going to need to just really get down in the dirt and say, Lord, make me believe that you are gained. You are all that I want. Sometimes it's just going to take some soul searching. Lord, help me make my heart believe, God. Make my heart understand, Lord. Paul shows us here that we could have Jesus in, in all of life and that he is worth far more than anything we could ever imagine. And that he is with us every step of the way. And that we could know him more and more every step of the way. I mean, Paul, in these last three verses of this passage, we see, we see, here's a little theology lesson, we see salvation, sanctification, and glorification all laid out in these last three verses. We see right there in verse 9, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, but, but he found me with his righteousness. Be found in him, verse 10, that I may know him. This is a, a present tense know, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. And I may share in his sufferings, right? I may know him through the thick and the thin. I may get to know him more and more and be sanctified more and more until the end, right? Verse 11, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead, that I may rise again with him, that I may be glorified with him and reign over it all forever. I mean, Paul is really, we kind of see here, we see where Paul's mindset is. We see why he has the confidence that he has. He focuses in on this Jesus and all that he's done for him and all that he is for him. And he knows all that he isn't. Let's break that down. Let's look into Paul's head and then, and then we're going to close out. But Paul says, verse 9, that, let's read it. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Paul talks about how, how Christ is everything, even in just being found in him. Not having this righteousness of our own, not being good enough on our own. Our simple ways, our imperfect ways aren't good enough for, for us just to reach out to God. But, but God found us in his perfect righteousness so that we may know him. And in that, we've had this, we have this double imputation, right? We take our perfection, we give it to Christ. It was laid on him at the cross once and for all, for all believers, and his righteousness is given to us. We're singing all about righteousness today. Dave had a, had a great lineup because the righteousness of Christ in us is the saving work of Jesus. It's good news for us. We, you know, righteousness might sound a little boring. Oh, we're talking about righteousness. What does that even mean? You know what I mean? But, but here's the thing. It means that all of Jesus' good is in us. And it's covering every spot of bad that we have. Not having a righteousness of our own. He became sin, right? Second Corinthians, who knew no sin. That we might become what? His righteousness. And everybody says amen for that Chris Tomlin song that we all just remembered, right? But you know, this is offensive a bit to those of us who don't believe. This idea that there's no good in us. I was having a conversation with the loved one of mine, um, family member, 
who uh, just shared with me, she's not a believer, shared with me, Rich, you know, I'm a good person. And Jesus tells me I'm, I'm not. She kind of talked about how Christianity was really just a crutch for weak people. It's a common thing to hear, right? Uh, those of you who have shared the gospel with others who don't believe, very common defense uh, against the gospel. <clears throat> and, you know, I just thought about that. Crutch for those who believe in it. And I was just kind of like, you know what? You're right. You're right. Christianity is, is a crutch. In fact, it might be worse than a crutch. I think, I think it's kind of like, like God took me out of this body bag and pulled me up and breathed life into me. Like I wasn't just limping along kind of hurting. I was, I was dead. I was gone. And, and guess what? He doesn't, he doesn't just let me go on my own then. No, he continues to, to sustain me and breathe life into me. So you're right. It is a crutch. It's more than a crutch. It's a body bag. And, and the life giver came and gave me life. And I want to say here, some of you have, have prayed a prayer. You've walked an aisle. You've raised a hand. But you've never actually known Jesus. That double imputation, that God's righteousness onto you is available for you today because salvation is not an end and then you live like hell until you go to glory. Salvation is a transformative work and it is a start. It's a beginning for you. It is a beginning for you. Hey, church, verse 9, to be found in Jesus. Man, if this is true, what ground does Paul have to stand on? What ground do we have to stand on besides Christ? None. By Christ's power alone we are saved, but, but he doesn't leave us there. He doesn't leave us saved, but he begins to transform us, to sanctify us. He, he talks about in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I may know him. This is a present tense know. This is a continuing to know him more and more, walking in this newness of life. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, right, is the power that resides within us, for you believers, like you have the, the Spirit of God, this, this resurrection power within you. When you hit that dead end, when you're ticked off at life, when you're ticked off at God, remember that he resides within you. Stop leaning on all of the loss and lean into the gain that he's given us. Lean into him. Press in to him because his Spirit is within us. And we could live this, as, as, as Hunter says, this with God life, this, this life of power, this life of, of growth. And even when things get tough, knowing the power of his resurrection, we can share in his sufferings. We can go through tough times. We're going to feel the ripple effects of sin. We're going to feel the effect of, of other people's sin even. It's brutal. We have a, a broken and marred creation ever since day one. But this suffering isn't a sign of God's neglect. This suffering is not a sign of neglect, but instead it's God drawing us deeper into intimacy with him, having us lean more and more on that crutch, having us more and more understand the fact that he pulled us out of the body bag, and he's the one who's sustaining us now drawing us in, reminding us that he is the only gain we have in life. The power of his resurrection allows for strong endurance during times of suffering. And man, if we are found in him by Christ alone, we are sanctified in him by Christ alone. Man, if this is true, what ground do we have to stand on, church, besides Christ? None. None. Christ alone empowers us to live life in all of its fullness. But Paul continues on as we get a look at, at his mind and how he could say all of this with such confidence. He says in verse 11 that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul's not questioning whether resurrection is going to happen. He's not questioning whether he's going to be in glory with God. 
He knows he'll be there. He knows, uh, look at 1 Peter 1, I think it's verse 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is one of my favorites here. This is good. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Paul knows that he will be risen with Christ. He knows that all, that all that Jesus will inherit, all of Christ's inheritance, right now he's at the right hand of God, all that he will inherit is ours because we are, Romans 8, co-heirs with Christ. We are co-heirs with him. All that is Christ's is ours. And when we get to this stage of glorification, when we're with him forever, we are going to get a bunch of things. We're going to get a new world, a new heavens and a new earth, and we will reign over it with him forever. And we're going to get new bodies. I'm going to shed 20 pounds and be jacked. <laughs> Seriously, watch out. We'll be perfected. We won't need medication. We won't need any oils for you oil folk. You know I call you out sometimes. I love you. We won't need anything. Because all the aches and pains... My herniated disc in my lower back isn't going to hurt. Like some of you right here, you're, you're, you're aching. You're, your bodies are groaning for more. We're going to have more in its fullness. But the thing we're going to get best is we're going to get God. We're going to get God in his fullness, all of him unfettered forever. Paul was so sure of his resurrection, so sure that he's going to reign with this Christ forever. So if in Christ we are saved, if in Christ we are sanctified, man, in Christ we're going to be with him forever. If this is true, we start to understand why Paul is so darn confident. If this is true, what ground do we have to stand on besides Christ? None. It's Christ alone. In Christ alone our hope is found. In Christ alone we have hope. In him alone we, we don't need anything else. Stop adding to things. Know him. Stop living your life in a way that he's not asking you to. He's asking you to seek him out. You don't need to come cleaned up. He accepts, he accepts the drunken cry of, Lord, help me, just as much as he does the pious cry of someone who's in the word early in the morning with a cup of coffee. He hears you. Know him. That's above it all. If we ever teach you anything besides know Christ, don't listen. Know him. Just know him because you can know the power of his resurrection and you can get through the chaos of life through that. My friends, just know him. Consider him. Church, we can know him all the more. Unbeliever, you can know fullness of life. You're going to keep going and trying to search for satisfaction. You're never going to be able to lay your head down on your pillow at night and feel like you figured it out until you see Christ in his rightful spot on the throne. So I want to close out with this. Church, you get tired of making your own version of Christianity with rules and regulations, with this list of check boxes that, that you are going to try to accomplish when Jesus has already accomplished it. Let's not be the Judaizers. Let's not do that. But let's know that the saving work and the sanctifying work is all Him. And one thing that I even considered as I prepared this is rich. You can't set these unbiblical standards for yourself. You can't set them for your children either. My little girl, I want her to know Christ. I want her to know Jesus. I grew up in a tradition where I thought knowing Jesus was being so afraid that I was going to have sex before I was married, that I was going to get drunk, that I was going to do drugs. And I stayed away from a lot of those things out of fear. I didn't stay away from them because I knew Christ and that he was incredibly more than all of it. For us and for our children, we want to know Christ and how he is incredibly more than all of it.